What was the context of debates and ideas that led you to think about this issue in the first place? Well, you know, my uh, early research in demography uh, had to do with migration. And uh, back then, uh, people used to think simply about domestic migration, people who are U.S.-born citizens moving around the country. It was a big part of the demography field back then. Immigration was seen as kind of something else. Uh, have different kinds of act, uh, different kinds of determinants, different people involved, and so forth. So I started doing some articles to find out how different is domestic migration, people, people moving within the United States, compared to immigration. You know, and to what degree are they doing different things to different places? And in, in you know the early '90s and mid '90s, when I wrote these articles, this one in particular, but other ones like it. Uh, you know, I found that domestic migrants were going to different places than immigrants were going. Uh, at that particular time, the very fast-growing parts of the country, and to some degree continues to be the case, uh, were in the southeastern part of the United States, places like Georgia or North Carolina, Florida, and, and in the western part of the United States, uh, east of California, uh, Nevada, and Colorado, and places like that. So uh, people, domestic migrants, were leaving all other parts of the country, like Michigan or upstate New York or someplace like that where the economy isn't very good, and going to these really hot spots. Now at the same time, there were immigrants coming to the U.S. Uh, where they landed at that time, uh, they didn't know about all the economy going on inside the United States. They knew that they had relatives in Los Angeles, they knew they had relatives in New York, they knew they had relatives in Miami. And they went there to join their relatives, because a lot of times they didn't speak English when they first got here. Their relatives had been here for a while. They could help them go, get along with what was going on in the United States. The classic and, chain migration. Yes, exactly. And so you had uh, you know, big enclaves of Hispanics and Asians in places like San Francisco and Los Angeles, Caribbean immigrants in Miami, New York from all over the place, Asians as well as some people from Puerto Rico. They weren't really immigrants, but also Hispanic immigrant groups in New York City. So, you know, the, the, the bottom line is the domestic migrants were going to different places than immigrants were going. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I looked at this and I said, you know, this is something that's interesting because immigrants at that time, as they are today, are not a microcosm of the U.S. population. Actually, they are a little bit more today than they were back then, but they were people from Latin America, they were mm -hmm. people from Asia, they tended to be younger. And the domestic migrants back then were largely whites and blacks. And uh, so I thought, well, you know, the country's moving in different ways, we're going to have all these new minorities, these people from Latin America and Asia, sort of clustered on one parts of the country. And, you know, domestic migrants uh, moving whites, largely blacks, to another part of the country. So I came up with the term demographic balkanization, mm -hmm. that, the, that these, these two groups were going to kind of move in different ways. And I was a little fearful of this because I felt that, you know, there might be some of these parts of the country where there, people aren't going to be too accepting of uh, people of different backgrounds from Latin America or from Asia because they speak a different language, they have a different culture, and they didn't see them. You know, they didn't see them because the domestic migrants were moving to these places and the immigrants were kind of stuck in these other places. You know, and you know, they could make even a case that in some cases the domestic migrants were leaving because of the immigrants. There's an economic explanation in that a lot of low-skilled jobs were taken by new groups coming in, were able to work more cheaply, were not as unionized, uh, might have been, been exploited a little more, and employers were more able to hire those folks at a lower wage. Uh, than the domestic migrants who saw, well, they can get jobs somewhere else, so they would just move. The immigrants were kind of stuck because, you know, they had this kind of pull of their culture of people who needed to help them along in their first generation and second generation. Domestic migrants didn't have to worry about that. I mean, they can move anywhere. You can speak English So there anywhere, was some concern at that point about the idea that, uh, that these people might be taking away jobs from Americans. I know the AFL-CIO was commissioning studies of the effects of immigrants. And the NAACP was interested in studies of the effects of immigrants, but people like Tom Espenshade were finding that there didn't seem to be much local labor market impact of these, of these immigrants. And then you came along and said, it's not just the local labor market that's the issue. Yeah, it's a bigger picture about lo it's one of the motivations of why people move somewhere mm -hmm. and other people who have the opportunities to move somewhere else.
uh, compared to those people who were just the new immigrants who were moving into these areas. I mean, there probably was a little bit of, of job displacement. The National Academy of Sciences did a big report that studied this stuff back then, and they said what you just said. Uh, it wasn't a big deal. There was a little bit of an impact, but it wasn't mm -hmm. much that These much immigrants bigger. were having a multiplier effect yes, in the local economy and so right. on and so on. That's yeah. right. So anyway, that's how I came up with this balkanization stuff. The, the reactions to this surprised me because somehow this got in the middle of a political debate about immigration to the United States. Is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? And one of the issues of the ones you just raised are immigrants taking jobs away from Americans, native mm -hmm. born Americans. And, you know, I didn't even think about that when I, did, when I first did this That's study. That's interesting. Uh, yeah. I, I thought this is an interesting migration analysis to do that nobody ever had done before, treating domestic migrants as but a different kind But it broke kind of down the, the box everybody had been thinking in, that it's just the local labor market where you're going to see the effects of this kind of thing. Yes, and, that's correct. And everybody, as soon as they read this article, slapped themselves on the forehead and said, why didn't I think of that? Yeah. Right? Um, so, Where yeah, I got in the middle of it, and, and you know, people were accusing me of, uh, you know, trying to not be a proponent of immigration. I didn't even think about that when I was doing this. Mm -hmm. I wasn't trying to give fuel to the people who said uh, we should stop immigration because immigrants are taking jobs away from Americans. That was the last thing in my mind when I wrote yeah. this. When I wrote this or, the, or the people <laughs> on the other side who said that immigrants are good for the economy yes. and we need more and more and more of them. Yes. Uh, but, yeah. <laughs> but they both wanted to claim your findings. Yeah, and, and this is a good example if you're a social scientist. If you go into the field of social science and you want to do serious demographic work, uh, you can occasionally get caught in the middle of something you have no idea that your work is going to be uh, mm -hmm. you know, a flashpoint for. And I, frankly, was just surprised by the whole thing. When you were <laughs> thinking about these things and getting ready to write the article, were you talking to a lot of other people, like colleagues, and grads, t dealing with this in grad seminars and things, or are you just um, sort of reflecting on this on your own and just it just came to you while you were sitting in your study or yeah, something Yeah, I like think that? it's more the latter. I mean, as I said, most of my research up to that time was on migration to the United States, so I just saw this as an extension of a lot of the work that I had already done, mm -hmm. bringing in the immigrant part of it to my all my other work on that, felt, that dealt more with domestic migration in the United States. So, how would you characterize the reaction? In, in, was it was it a two pronged reaction to this article, or three? Or, or do you notice any tendencies in the way scholars reacted to your work? Well, you know, the scholars, you know, there's this whole thing about political correctness. A lot of people um, accuse social scientists, maybe sociologists in particular, yes, of sort of honing a certain line that you had to you know, follow certain policy prescriptions that were dictated by, who knows, you know, so mm -hmm. leaders in, you know, ideology or whatever. Yes. And uh, I felt I might have hit a nerve with people who were either sort of one side of the line versus the other side of the line. And again, I, <laughs> I had no idea. Well, that may be an indication that you've really hit on something important. <laughs> yeah, They perhaps. all get worked up about it. Perhaps. I guess that's right. I guess that's right. So, uh, you know, and, and, you know, another thing is in, I got invited uh, this is something that also other people uh, who are getting into demography or sociology and have sort of overlap into policy issues. Uh, I got invited, and you know, I was at the University of Michigan then. All I, my whole life was in the university environment, teaching students, writing articles, and all of this. And I got invited to Washington, D.C. by a, or a, a, what turned out to be an advocacy organization. I didn't really know the difference between an advocacy organization or some good group that's just putting out information. Uh, and I was so flattered. Somebody from Washington, D.C. wanted to see my research <laughs> and uh, wanted yep. me to come there and talk to mm -hmm. them. Uh, I thought, wow, you know, this is, you know, I'm just a researcher. What, what, what's this all about? And, you know, I went there and, I, you know, they had me give a talk. And they said, well, do you mind if we write up some of your stuff in our newsletter? And oh, stuff? boy. And it, this is a real anti-immigrant group. Uh, I can't even remember the name of it anymore. I don't know if it exists. Uh, but... Uh, you know, they were plastering my stuff all over the country, you know, as if I was advocating their anti-immigrant stance on mm, things. Shut the borders. Uh, and, uh, boy, you know, I soon learned about this. You know, and now I am in Washington, D.C. I'm more at, this is many years later now, and I'm, I'm more savvy about who's doing what and where you have to be a little bit fearful about having your research put in the wrong place. But back then, you know, I got, that even put me more in the middle of all of this. So that, that mm -hmm. was kind of an eye-opener. So that's quite a reaction to this paper. 
among these policy people who were advocating different things, but also there was a big scholarly reaction to this to this paper uh, among all the other people out there like me who read this and thought, why didn't I think of that? Um, when you were doing the actual data analysis for this and looking at first at states and then at, at major metro areas within the states, um, what kind of problems did you run into with that analysis? That do you recall? Because some of the some of the states and some of the metro areas looked like they fit this idea that the places where the migrants are coming in are the same places where the natives are leaving. But some of them didn't always line up. The, a few of them didn't line up. And what were you thinking at that point about why some of them might not be lining up? Yeah, the ones that didn't line up as carefully were the ones in Texas. Uh, mm -hmm. Texas continues to be a state, even today, that attracts both immigrants and domestic migrants. When you have a very strong and economy. And Florida as well. But and that's, Florida as well, the, the, uh, the non-Miami part of Florida. Right. Well, <laughs> that, that was, I, I suspected that that may be why you went to the metro areas instead, yes. because the state was just too big an analysis. Florida yeah. is actually like three yeah. states. And, and you could even look at interior California. Riverside was not like Los Angeles. Los Angeles uh, was you know, spitting out domestic migrants, but many of them were going to Riverside as if they were going to Las Vegas, which is pretty close by to, to Riverside, okay. California. So yeah, the state levels tended to make it a little cruder than uh, when you go to the metropolitan area. And as I said, the main, the main magnet of driving domestic migrants were, were jobs. Mm -hmm. And in that particular period, uh, Texas was a big magnet for domestic migrants, but at the same time, because of its Still history seems to next be, to the, yeah. the Mexican border, was was also getting a lot of immigrants. So they were getting both. They didn't quite fit the model. Mm -hmm. Well, after many years of thinking about this and listening to other people complaining about your article or praising your article and so on, uh, where do you come down on all of these issues today? What's your current thinking on on these topics? Well, you know, I've continued to look at these migration patterns and. Uh, after the 2010, after, the, after even the 2000 census and into the 2000s, I noticed that uh, uh, foreign-born, but also in general Hispanics, uh, were moving to these states that only whites were moving to, and right. the South blacks were moving to. So that the, like the Balkanization issue uh, was no longer a big issue. Now, if you looked at more carefully, though, uh, part of the the population, the white population that was leaving, maybe Los Angeles or Miami or someplace were the lower skilled, middle skilled part of the white population. College graduate whites were always moving to wherever, the, even if it was Los Angeles, or, because they were always Los Angeles with all its movie business and high tech industry and all, would, would attract well educated people. And people. the Bay Area. And, 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 right. But the people who were sort of lower skilled and middle skilled, those were the people who were leaving to go to these hot housing markets in the in the Mountain West or in the Southeast, leaving Los Angeles, leaving Miami, leaving New York. But in your perspective, they're being drawn by economic attractors Correct. rather than pushed out by a bunch of migrants. Correct. But as we moved further, forward, and as there were more uh, Hispanics moving to the United States, more Asians moving to the United States, they too were able to overcome the language barriers, were not as constrained by these enclaves and these areas, and they too were able to follow the jobs into these other places. And I already noticed this in the, even in the late 90s, because in the 2000 census they asked a five-year migration question, which mm -hmm. was between 1995 and 2000, where right. did you move? And, it, and then I actually found there were more Hispanics leaving Los Angeles than whites for the 1995 to mm -hmm. 2000 right. period. And that has continued. Uh, it's slowed down a little bit in the last uh, few years because of the recession and the post-recession job turn. Whites and minorities were not moving to these hotspots nearly as much, but, but I think that's going to pick up again. But my fears about balkanization, I think, have largely uh, been alleviated. And in my new book, Diversity Explosion, um, I have a section in there talking about how there were worries about balkanization. And that now, I don't think we need to worry about that as much because the economic drivers of these new immigrants and their children and then their grandchildren are pulling them to all parts of the country. And now the big issue, I think, is for people to embrace them everywhere, but they're seeing them all the time mm -hmm. where they weren't before. That's what I was worried about. Do you these think were people who were somewhere else that the mainstream people in these middle part of the country didn't know about them. 
now they're getting to know them, so I think I'm more So balkanization is not a problem at the state level or even as between different metro areas in the United States. You can't say these metro areas are going to have only this group and then another group will be somewhere else. What about within metro areas? Do you, this, this sort of leads us to the issue of, uh, of segregation and sort of micro balkanization within metro areas. Uh, have you worked very much with that issue? Well, you know, this is an this is an issue that, firstly, when you talked about when you talk about segregation in the United States, immediately it comes to mind to people of blacks and whites because right. it's the most long-standing, highly segregated phenomena we have, and we certainly have still have a lot of segregation between blacks and whites, but it has come down from where it was back in the. 50s and 60s, uh, there's, a, there's an index called a segregation index or a dissimilarity index where if you have an index of 100, it means all the blacks are in one set of neighborhoods, all the whites are in another set of neighborhoods. When we were back in the 1960s and 1950s and 1960s, that index for lots of cities where that had a lot of blacks in the United States was in the 80s, in some cases even the 90s. That 80% of blacks or 90% of blacks would have to move to another neighborhood to be mm -hmm. distributed just like whites. That's come down on average in the United States. That index is more in the 50s right now and in some places even in the 40s. Uh, and uh, so, you know, it's still not uh, what you would call evenly distributed when 40 or 50% of one race has to move to be distributed like the other race. But we've made huge progress. And where we made the most progress on the, in that index is in growing places because if you think about it, sure. How, do, how, do, how does a population mix change? It's in places where people are moving to rather than where, where people are moving it up. from. People are moving from, that means there's nobody in there to kind of read, you know, shake things up a little bit. Uh, and then, of course, in 1968, there was a Fair Housing Act that was, what was enacted by uh, a law that was enacted by Congress, and that made it absolutely illegal to discriminate in the renting and selling of homes. It still means there was stuff going on. But you, know, you have to be a lot more clever about it now. But, yeah. uh, and so all of those cities that grew a lot since 1968, uh, their segregation levels came incrementally down because of the growth and because of the new law. Now, for Hispanics, uh, of course, you know, they're a continued more fluid new immigrant group to the United States. They initially moved to places, as I said, uh, to where they have uh, fellow countrymen, people who speak the same language. So there is kind of a self-segregation initially uh, mm -hmm. for Hispanics. But I've found that, uh, and so what's going on now for the segregation of Hispanics, if you look at it nationally, it's a lower level for blacks. It's a much lower level for blacks. Whites are much more accepting uh, living in a neighborhood with Hispanics than they are for blacks because of the, the harsh history we've had in race relations between mm -hmm. whites and blacks in our history. But uh, there's two kinds of patterns going on. The new immigrants are coming and they're self-segregating in a way. Uh, the second and third generation Hispanics are, that are moving out to these new destinations in the South and in the, in the Mountain West are more dispersed than they are in those, those destinations. So if you look at the segregation for Hispanics over the last 20 years, it looks like it's flat, that it's not moving along. But underneath that flat line are those places that are continuing to be segregated over the new Hispanic immigrants countered by the lower segregation of the Hispanics that are moving to these other areas. So as we have more and more Hispanics uh, being in the United States, becoming part of the second generation, becoming the third, third generation, yes. moving out to these other areas, I predict we'll see that segregation level go down for Hispanics as well. So it's, it's a segregation is the one index that is the most sticky, I think, of all these, all these indexes. I mean, another index is interracial marriages. That's ballooning in the United right. States. Uh, but the housing segregation, although it's coming down, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come down at a much slower pace than some of these other measures that we're looking at. Okay. Well, the idea of balkanization may not be an imminent threat any longer and may not be looming over us, but the, the whole concept of considering the different patterns of migration for immigrants and for native-born Americans moving around within the country really has changed the way we think about this whole subject and has, has advanced the debate on what's going on in American society. So I would like to thank you for writing the article and for helping to discuss it today. Oh, thank, thank you, you very much. Enjoyed it.